Yippee ki Merry Christmas. I know the Yippee ki has something else coming after it in the move we're talking about today, Die Hard. But, you know, I get enough people complaining about my language. I'm not going to use the uh, the Fuddrucker language right there, but yippee ki yay Fuddrucker. So today we're heading for Nakatomi Plaza and a special Christmas episode of The Aggressive Life all about the best Christmas movie out there ever. Yeah, I said it. Christmas movie. Today is all Die Hard, all Die day long. We're talking John McClane, Hans Gruber. We're talking throwing bad guys out of windows, jumping off buildings, tethered to fire hoses, and just being a general badass. I'm joined by diehard expert and author Kim Taylor Foster. She's a talented writer. She's focused a lot of her efforts on the film industry. She's contributed to global media powerhouses like Fandorn, IGN, the BBC. She's appeared at the San Diego Comic Con as part of the Screen Junkies panel. She is everywhere movie lovers are, and it's just in time for Christmas. She's released The Definitive Guide to John McClane's Christmas Party Gone Awry, and her book is called why we love Die Hard. I've got a copy right here with me, full of trivia, behind the scenes commentary, essays about the movie. It's freaking awesome. Kim Taylor Foster, <laughs> welcome to the Aggressive Life. Oh, hello. Thank you for having me. I hope I can live up to uh, the level of aggression that you're expecting. <laughs> oh, you're not even living up to it. You're already exceeding it with that English accent that you have. You know, I'm a sucker for English accents. <laughs> Oh, that's good to hear. Um, yeah, I was born in Reading, lived in London, and now I'm on the south coast of England. So, uh, wow. a very southern accent. What, what do you th- What do you think it is? Before we get into our topic at hand, what do you think it is about us Americans? We thought much about it. why is it that Americans love the English accent. We don't necessarily love the German accent or some other, but but the English accent, just like oh. No, just keep talking. What, what, do you Englanders know how mesmerizing it is to us and why do you think it is? Oh, well, it's bizarre, isn't it? I, I don't know. I think it probably has something to do with being, you know, wrapped up in, in all the history that we have, not all good. You know, we go back a long way. Um, but also, you know, we, we grew up uh, on American movies. So I think we are almost equally enchanted by the American accent. It's the same language that we speak. But in a, it sounds different. So, um, you know, may, uh, uh, <laughs> and for some reason, I think you think we sound posh. <laughs> uh, I don't know about posh. I just think you sound awesome. You, you, you're telling me that the ag- average <laughs> England person loves the American accent? I mean, I, th- I would say so. I don't think that we would admit it. Most of us <laughs> would not admit it. But <laughs> All right. Well, hey, let's start with the obvious. Why... Do you love Die Hard? You've got to love Die Hard in order to write a book about it. Well, yeah. And, you know, all of the reasons that I detail in the book are also my reasons as well as everybody else's reasons. You know, and some of them are conscious and some of them are unconscious. And I've I've dived into that. But but I suppose for me, uh, initially, it's it's nostalgia, which is a big driver for me. I was a kid in 1988 and... Uh, uh, action movies and horror were the first genres I really loved. And um, uh, I was of the right age, I think, to really kind of soak this up. Um, but, but you know, in terms of it, of Die Hard standing out amongst the others, and, and I love the other 80s action movies, um, you know, but a lot of it's dumb and empty and there's more to Die Hard. And I think that's why... It's endured. There's so much more to it than it might appear on, uh, you know, at first glance. There is a lot to it. I went to Die Hard in the theaters and people forget this thing. I mean, our way of life has changed so much over the last, I mean, 25 years, whatever. How old is Die Hard now, Kim? How long has Die Hard been out for? So 1988 was when it came out. So do the maths. It was, uh, it's... It's over 30 years. 34 years. years 34 <laughs> 34. Years. I mean, 34 years ago, we used to go to movie theaters because we didn't have much else to do. You had cable new, cable TV, but it wasn't like you had Netflix, Hulu. You don't have social media. And you would go to these movies not really knowing much about it. You'd read an article in a magazine or in a paper 
you you wouldn't really have any idea what you're doing. I, can't, we, I remember going, ah, I could die hard. Okay, what? Yeah, let's go. I don't really like the the guy from Moonlight or Moonstruck, whatever Bruce, whatever Bruce Willis was in. But we're like, yeah, oh, okay, we have nothing better. Let's just go do it. And then we just got our freaking minds blown. When we went in. It was it was really an unbelievable experience when you have no idea what you're walking into. Yeah, it, uh, t- um, uh, totally. You know, I didn't see it in uh, the cinema. I wasn't quite old enough, but I would have seen it for the first time, probably probably on TV, heavily edited. <laughs> I expect Yippie Kaye was missing that, that, that final word. But, um, Fud Rucker. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it changed the genre. It changed the action movie forever. Uh, it was that impactful. Um and it gave us an action hero um, in John McClane that was unlike anything we'd seen before. Um, he was an, you know, an everyman and a reluctant hero, uh, which was a far cry from the likes of Arnold Schwarzenegger's characters in the films from the 80s. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, let's get to him in just a moment, but let's just settle this once and for all. It is a Christmas movie. You agree, correct? And why? I do agree. Yes, it is a Christmas movie. And here's why. Um, You know, it's also an action movie. And that's okay. It can be both things. There are a lot of movies that exist that are more than one thing. We have films that straddle genres. We have action comedies, Lethal Weapon, which you might argue is also a Christmas movie because I think that's set at Christmas. Um, You know, Home Alone, nobody would argue that that wasn't a Christmas movie, but it's also uh, an 80s comedy and an action film. And so Die Hard is very definitely an action movie and a Christmas movie. It ticks all the Christmas movie boxes. And the the, the, um, gauge I use in the book is, is looking at what you might call the typical Christmas movie, right? Which is, which we used to call Hallmark movies. Um, which have a dumb plot, you know, um, I say dumb, but they, they all kind of follow the same, the same path. You get um, someone that ends a character who travels to an environment associated with a former partner or a potential new love interest who the two on the surface seem, seem diametrically opposed to one another. Uh, and it's usually a high flying career or, a life-changing opportunity that gets between them, that keeps the two apart. Tick. These things occur in Die Hard. The protagonist um, usually becomes trapped or often becomes trapped at the location in question. In a Hallmark movie, it might be because of, you know, a dangerous snowfall um, or transport problems. In this, it's, you know, a bunch of uh, terrorists taking over uh, a building um, but uh, then ultimately, the the two leads, the the female and the male, kind of romantic leads, uh, end up reconciling or a romance sparks, and that's exactly what happens in this film. So it ticks all the boxes. Stephen Stephen E. D'Souza, who was one of the writers on the film, also said uh, that it was a Christmas film and compared it to White Christmas. Really, and yet. Uh, Die Hard has more Christmas credentials than White Christmas does. Fascinating. I saw White Christmas for the first time about two years ago. I thought, I got to, you know, I got to see it. It's got to be, must be a good movie. It was not a good movie. I I didn't enjoy it at all. And I like old movies, but. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it was really weird. Yeah. When they were making Die Hard, Kim, did, did they have any idea that they were on to something? Did they think that this is going to be an enduring classic and and spin off a number of sequels and even be talked about 34 years later as a Christmas movie? Did they did they think that this would be one of the standards in American cinema? It almost sounds sounds funny and a joke to say it, but it is one of the standards in American cinema. Like everyone has heard of Die Hard. It, it evokes something. Did they have any clue what they were making at the time? Yeah, no. Uh, you know, I would say on the whole they didn't, but, but Joel Silver... Uh, who was the producer on the film. I mean, it was his idea to make it a Christmas movie. It was his idea to set it at Christmas and make sure that all of those Christmas references that are woven into the film were there because he knew that by doing that, it would be syndicationable and people would watch it every year. And that's exactly what happened. 
Um, but I don't think anyone had any clue that it would be become this, um, you know, game changing action film as well. They were innovating a lot of things on the run, I thought. Didn't they adjust the script based on what the building was? They found the building at the last minute or something like that. I haven't read your book. I want to. I haven't I haven't had the opportunity to read it yet. Yeah. Wasn't there a lot of adaptation on the run? Well, the the um, building, you know, they used the old uh, the Fox building um, in Los Angeles. So it wasn't a set. It, you know, it was it was an actual building that was that was under construction and they were given um, permission to use it. So, yes, they had to write around what um, was going on in the building, the state of the building and improvise a little bit. Um, but also because Bruce Willis at the time was con contractually obligated to moonlighting and he almost the tv series moonlighting and he almost well he did decline this film initially when they offered it to him because of his obligations to moonlighting but it, uh, because uh, Sybil Shepherd was pregnant and they were forced to stop filming moonlighting she she co-starred with him on that series it gave him a window to accept and so um they they adapted the character around Bruce Willis's own personality. John McTin and the director, huh. yeah, yeah. John McTin and the, the director was was quite um, an experimental filmmaker, particularly at that time, and was heavily influenced by uh, European cinema. He loved the Dutch uh, director Paul Verhoeven, and and you know brought some of his um, techniques into the film, which were also innovative in Hollywood cinema. Um, but yes, they, he met Bruce Willis and wanted to inject joy into the film because it's based on a novel that was quite grim, quite bleak. And he wanted to make it more uplifting, more joyful. And meeting Bruce Willis, it gave him inspiration to kind of rewrite that lead character. And he became what he became, which is really cool. <laughs> that is cool. You know, you, you often hear about um, movies that could have cast someone else. You maybe don't, although it's kind of jarring, you maybe don't envisage the whole film as being different, but this really would have been. And he nearly wasn't cast. If it wasn't Bruce Willis, who would it have been? They initially offered the role to Frank Sinatra. What? I know. <laughs> well, he, he had played the character before in a film in 1968, I think it was, called The Detective. Roderick Thorpe's novel, The Detective, was a prequel to his novel, Nothing Lasts Forever, which Die Hard is based on. Um, the character had a different name and was as, was much grittier. And if you if you watch that film, you'll see Frank Sinatra's uh, character was very different to um, John McClane. Anyway, I think contractually they were obliged to offer it to him. And he was in his 70s then. And I don't think they really felt that he was a good fit. But thankfully, he declined. And then they approached kind of a, a list, a laundry list of, of actors before Bruce Willis, whose career was in its infancy. He'd had two attempts to make movies with Blake Edwards, as it happened, uh, directing. They both bombed. So people weren't really willing to take a chance on him in this. Their hand was forced in the end. So, But they asked Arnold Schwarzenegger, who declined. You can imagine the kind of film it would have been yeah. had he been in the role. He right. decided he wanted to try, you know, out and out comedy and took twins instead. Um, Al Pacino, Harrison Ford, Robert De Niro were all in the mix before they came to Bruce Willis. <laughs> well, yeah, you're right. If they adjusted the screen or the the plot or the just the lines for Bruce Willis, I guess they could have done it for those actors. It would have been fine, but he's just, he's just perfect. And why do you think he is so perfect for this? What, what, what makes us like him so much in this role? Well, I think he, he embodies, um, or he did at least in his early career, the everyman. I mean, if you've, if you've seen him in Moonlighting, he was a similar kind of wisecracking character. Um, but the, but the fact that uh, I, I think, you know, John McTinnon is on record as saying um, that John McClane is Bruce Willis because they base the character on him, ultimately. He is that. And so 
he embodies that character because it's him, essentially. <laughs> I don't think he's ever, you know, taken down a bunch of terrorists in a building. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, the wisecracking, the everyman kind of uh, uh, thing that he has that we feel we can project ourselves onto, even me <laughs> as a woman. Yeah. Um, that's him. So, yeah, John Wayne was always John Wayne, every single movie. They shouldn't even have changed his name as a character. Just should have been John Wayne all the time. And you're saying that Bruce Willis had that same kind of thing going. Yes. Yeah, I think so. You know, and if you look at his later career, um, you know, he's had quite a diverse career. But, you know, later in his career, he kind of has has gone on to take roles off the back of Die Hard. Right. They're yep. all versions of John McClane in some form or another, whether they're cops or or, you know, it's an action movie. Um, so that's that's interesting. You can take any movie and put some Christmas trees in it and some lights and I guess call it a Christmas movie. But it isn't the fact that this is a Christmas movie that we're arguing for. It's not that. What is it about the movie that strikes our heart? What What is the, what is the magic about it? Um, I mean, it's a... It's a mix of ingredients, I suppose. But I think, you know, John McTiernan and the, the whole team have struck on, uh, at that time, struck on this formula that brings kind of hardcore action. And some of it is quite, and you know, some of it's quite brutal. Some of the the violence, some of the, the uh, you know, injuries you see with this joyous tone and, and this sense of, fun it's it never feels that threatening and you've got Hans Gruber who is one of cinema's greatest villains um Alan Rickman's performance is funny and um he said of his character that at the time you know it was kind of he it was such an effective villain that people would spit at him in the street really (laughs) oh my gosh yeah well, you had him. You had, uh, uh, what was his name? Was it Barishnikov or what was the Russian dancer who was also in the movie? Alexander Goodenough. There it is. Right. Ballet there it is. dancer turned actor. And uh, he, yeah, he was um, Russian uh, and played the character of Carl, who's, who's one, of, uh, one of Gruber's men. Yeah. What's your favorite lines in this movie? And how many of these lines... Did Bruce Willis make up or did he make none of them up? Like yippee ki stuff. Did he make that one up or did someone give him that line? No, someone gave him that line. Um, uh, the, you know, I think it the script, the screenplay was written by a guy called Jeb Stewart. Um, but I think Stephen E. D'Souza was responsible for a lot of those lines. And um, he'd phone in on the set when they were, they were like, we need a line for this for this moment, get Stephen on the line. Um, for instance, that when he's in the tunnel, when, when Bruce Willis is in the air duct, the air conditioning duct, um, and he says, uh, come out to the coast, we'll get together, have a few laughs. That was improvised on the phone by Stephen E. D'Souza in that moment. So Interesting. that's where most of those lines came uh, from. Right? That's cool. That's <laughs> yeah. very cool. How hard was it to sell a publisher on the idea of a diehard book? <laughs> It was easy. They came to me. <laughs> oh, really? That's cool. Um, Die Hard is so beloved, you know, and and it, it just keeps giving, doesn't it? It has. It's had a film, you know, every decade I think since it first came out. Um, there are five, and while critically they've all been received differently. I think they've all done pretty well at the box office. And I don't think we've seen the last of the franchise, although, you know, with um, with Disney now owning Fox as they do and Die Hard, we've yet to see what they will do with, uh, with the franchise going forward, but I'm sure it, we'll see it again. So yeah, it was easy to, to, uh, to persuade a publisher to, to publish a book about Die Hard. Well, Bruce Lewis, uh, Bruce Willis is, I think he's permanently retired. Doesn't he have some sort of health condition right now? He does. Yeah. Which is really sad. Um, a brain condition. Um, yeah, I, I, 
I don't know if he's fully retired, probably, but he's made a lot of films that still seem to keep coming out. Um, yeah, right, right. <laughs> uh, straight to streaming or whatever. So we've collected some of your quotes. I'm hoping I can read them to you, Kim, and then you can expound on them. Are you up for that? Sure, yes. Quote, in McLean, we see ourselves, but also the hero that we wish we could be. So what I mean by that is this idea that John McLean is an everyman. And uh, and before John McLean came along in action movies, the hero was, you know, a John Rambo or um, a Robocop or, um, you know, any of Arnie's characters. And they're they're all people that you can't really relate to. I mean, we enjoy watching them on screen and I love them as much as the next person, but you wouldn't project yourself into those characters in the way that you do John McClane because he's fallible like us. He's a reluctant hero, probably like, you know, if given the opportunity would be the same as most of us. Perhaps we, you know, our instinct is to, flee from danger, but um, he steps up because he has this this uh, sense of responsibility that it, that is a weight for him, but, um, but it's what drives him. Um, he uses humour as a mechanism, and I think a lot of us do that. He also has a moral compass, like, you know, most of us, I like to think. Um, and, and he steps up into this hero role, and I think that most of us, probably wish we could do that too. So so that's what I mean when I say that um, and would like to think that we could in a situation, maybe not quite like John McClane's situation, um, but, but could if required. So he's relatable and also this idealistic kind of figure. It was really it's powerful. rare back then to have a action hero or a hero that's going to take a physical stand, actually get cut and hurt and bleed. That was really weird. Like you mentioned those mm. old movies of the day, like Predator, one of those classic lines in Predator is Jesse Ventura gets shot or something. He says, I don't got time to bleed. I don't have time to bleed. Yeah. <laughs> He's this classic <laughs> macho, I don't get hurt, I can ignore it. And then we get John McClane just getting kicked all over the place, running, running without shoes on and getting glass stuck in his thing and he's I mean he's he's and he's hurt he's you, you could see him limping and hurting the whole movie and uh yeah all of us kind of walk yeah. with a limp anyway don't we yeah yeah absolutely yeah you're right he is he is someone who can get injured he thinks he's going to die at some point in the film you know he has that tearful call with that that heart to heart that he has with Powell his his ally his buddy cop in the movie um where he says tell my wife this because he thinks he's his days are numbered and um and you know he's in that situation and he's forced to to confront how he really feels and uh, i think we kind of identify with that that emotion and that depth of feeling as well and i think it's nice for men isn't it because because especially back then in the 80s you didn't have many male um role models on on in big hollywood movies that were vulnerable like that well, not just ones that were vulnerable, but ones that had a, a body you could relate to or you could aspire to. You're not going to aspire <laughs> to Arnold Schwarzenegger's body or, or uh, you know, or Sylvester Stallone. It, those guys are, you know, obviously just shooting yeah. stuff in their ass all the time. <laughs> and they're working out like nine yeah. hours a day, it looks like. But you looked at John McClane, you went, hmm. Okay, so I guess with my build, if I had to, I guess I could do that. Or at least he inspires me to think that I could. Yeah, absolutely. That is that is uh, a good point. He does have, you know, an aesthetic that is uh, relatable. Yeah, he's not a superhero like, you know, um, Arnold Schwarzenegger is on screen and his characters. He's uh, he's like most most of us. Not me, because I'm a woman, but. Yep. Yes, I can tell you're a woman. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Are you looking for something to help grow your spiritual muscles in 2023? I want to suggest you might want to check out my devotional for men called Move. 
a guy to get up and go forward. These are the conversations I have again and again and again and again and again with guys having coffee, having beers, or sitting around a campfire. It's core content that man after man is found helpful to get them to a new place. Right now, it's 50% off on Amazon. For nine bucks and change, you can put 70 days of practical spiritual teaching and application in your hands and in your mind and in your heart and in your limbs. And it makes a great gift for the hard to buy for guy. Head over to Amazon right now and get your copy of Move. Then drop me a line and let me know what you think. Today's podcast is brought to you by Athletic Greens. It's a product I use every day. I started taking AG1 because I don't watch my diet too closely, but I know that I'm getting all the vitamins, minerals, and nutrients I can, as well as hydrating with 12 ounces of water right off the bat at the beginning of the day. One scoop of AG1 has got 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens, and it doesn't taste like it. It actually tastes great. AG1 is a micro habit with big benefits. For less than $3 a day, you can take care of your health and invest in your future. It's recommended by professional athletes, health experts, and me. <laughs> to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packets with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash aggressive life. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash aggressive life to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutrition insurance. So go get you some and let's get back to the show. I've got another book that I wouldn't mind touching on if you're up for it. It's called Why mm -hmm. We Love the Matrix. Ooh, I would love to have a matrix discussion as well with somebody who's an expert. Tell me, why do we love the matrix? Oh, well, I, again, so many reasons. I wrote a similar book about it. Um, but, you know, again, it, it was a groundbreaking film in another way. Technologically, it pushed the boundaries. We, we love it for that. We love it on that level, you know, and in, in the cinema, it was a, a incredible experience, but it also brought, um, uh, martial arts, um, the way martial arts movies work choreographed and created and the special effects, the wire work, the gun foo from those movies into the Hollywood mainstream. So on the spectacle level, there's that, but also underneath it all, well, there's the, the fear of technology that it tapped into at the time. It came out in 1999. So the, the eve of the millennium, we were all scared about the millennium bug. Oh, uh, that's right. Resetting y the world. Y2K. Right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, so it tapped into this this burgeoning fear of technology we had around that period of time. Um, and also it's there's so much philosophy in it that that you get on um multiple viewings. The the Wachowskis, the directors of the film, were very into um kind of philosophical teachings and embedded a lot of this wisdom uh and and thinking into the film. So, and Keanu Reeves is great as well in the role, right? The way, the way Bruce Willis, uh, is perfect for John McClane. Keanu Reeves, uh, was perfect for Neo. Yeah, that's true. Very, very true. Well, my, my take on, on the matrix, and I'm sure you've heard this before and, and, and I'd love to hear your take on this. You might roll your eyes or just chime something in on it. You know, my take on it, you know, because my day job is a pastor. I don't know if you know that or not. That's my day job. I did. Yeah. My, my take on The Matrix is why I took off is it, it artistically represented something that at least the Bible says is spiritually true, that we're living in a false reality that what we live in right now is not the way things are supposed to ultimately be. And there are forces that are coming against us. And we, we have to choose not the red pill, or the blue pill. We have to choose either God and his ways or the way everybody else lives. And I think that that taps in a deep and for what I know the Wachowski brothers, they're very adamant. Like they did not, they did not write it with those things. Well, I'm sorry. You, you might not didn't maybe didn't mean to, but you actually did. Yeah, I agree with you. I, you know, whatever people get from a film, 
is in there, whether it was an in- intentional or not. So, and, and something like the matrix, um, uh, with all of its depth, with all of its philosophy lends itself, um, easily to different interpretations. And that's definitely one way of reading it. And there is a lot of kind of religious references, not, not all, uh, Christian or, you know, it covers a breadth of, of religions, um, within it, but, um, but yeah, th- th- that's embedded very deliberately in there. So, so they are making some kind of comment about faith. Well, and then was it on the, th- the third run out of the matrix series, they got a guy who's the key master, like, okay, the kingdom keys, the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> it just came up so much. I was like, what's well, asking, brothers? You can't get upset when all these Christians think that you're making a movie to enforce their worldview. I, we may be reading into it. I understand we may be reading into it, but like, there's a lot there it really is. Yeah. Well, the, as like I said, the thing about art, you know, is that it's open to interpretation and you bring bring your own reading to it. You bring yourself to whatever it might be. And so it, it is there whether they intended it or not, but they certainly sowed some seeds deliberately, I would say. Let me give you another one of your quotes, Kim. I'd like you to blow out if you would mind. You say, the cowboys of early and classical Hollywood fit neither into the civilized world nor into the wilderness, destined to walk the precarious line between the two. Similarly, John McClane is fated to fight the good fight as he nomadically wanders a kind of no man's land, straddling both sides as he attempts to uphold civilized values while protecting the innocent and defenseless. Well, yeah, this is all around. I've got a chapter in the book on um, uh, one of the reasons that we love Die Hard, probably unconsciously for most of us, is because uh, it borrows so heavily on the Western and the Western is, um, classic genre in cinema. Uh, and Die Hard has so many Western characteristics re- woven into it. So, um, that quote in particular, if, if John McClane, as I argue, kind of represents the cowboy, he is a, he is, uh, to all intents and purposes, a cowboy in Die Hard. Um, and cowboys often come into civilization in in westerns from outside it you see you see them come you, in the searchers you see um john wayne's character seemingly appear from nowhere from the wilderness or from wherever into this um the homestead which represents civilization just as kind of john mcclain does when he enters Los Angeles, we don't see him in his environment of New York. He enters Los Angeles on, you know, what I say is is his kind of steel horse on the aeroplane um, and lands on the wild west coast of Los Angeles. And once he's there, like a cowboy, he doesn't fit. He doesn't fit into the culture uh, that we see represented in Los Angeles um, and in particular in the Narcotomy Plaza, which is representative of uh, commerce, of capitalism and and civilization and, and the march of progress, right? So he doesn't quite fit there. In the fourth film, I think Timothy Oliphant's character calls John McClane a Timex watch in a digital age. And that fits here as well. You know, he's analog. He's not, he's not really one for the march of progress, but he's also, um, obviously he doesn't fit with the bad guys either. The, you know, the old Indians, the native Americans were, were the bad guys in, in Westerns often. Also the bad guys were the people seeking to develop. Um, and so here we've got capitalism. That's an enemy. The authorities here, the police, the FBI, they're the enemy. Um, and, although also representative of civilization and you know he's a misfit and he has to in the film stretch his relationship with the law and bureaucracy aka the good guys the good guys because they're not really good guys civilization in order to do what's right for him what's moral and what's right for the people he's protecting while also battling the bad guys so if so he he occupies this space in between 
civilization and the wilderness the way the cowboy does. Makes me want to be a cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why Westerns are just an enduring thing. I just can't get enough Westerns. You know, they were the Hollywood's bread and butter for a long time. They were, and they had all these complex characters, so like John McClane. Kim Taylor Foster, are you ready for the lightning round? This is when I give you a question and you have to answer it like lightning. Like real quick, like one or two sentences. Are you up for the challenge? I am up for the challenge. I uh, I promise to be as fast as I can humanly be. Well, if you go slower and we all get to listen to your English accent, no one's going to complain. <laughs> All right, here we go. What trait of John McClane do you see in your own life? Uh, I'm going to say integrity because I try to stay true to my word, uh, even if it's even if it's reluctantly so, or or I see see kind of um, obstacles in the way. Um, I don't want to let people down. Uh, I feel that sense of responsibility. I don't know if I feel that it's a weight always, like maybe John McClane does, but but that would be my answer. Integrity, I think. Your favorite diehard character that isn't John McClane and why? Well, you know, the easy answer is Gruber because um, Alan Rickman is amazing. This villain character is three-dimensional, but also quite what we would, I don't know if you know what pantomime is, but we would call it kind of pantomime. Um, so a bit over the top kind of, um, but but certainly three-dimensional and idiosyncratic, but I'm not going to say Hans Gruber because that's too easy. I'm going to go for Carl, who we touched on earlier, because he's oh. the, his presence in the film is cool and he's representative of some of these characters that, that have uh, kind of expanded roles in the film where they might just, in another film, kind of disappear into the background. Carl is the indestructible one. He's angry because uh, John McClane killed his brother. His brother is the guy that McClane sends down in the lift with the Santa hat on and the, now I have a machine gun, ho, 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 scrawled across his chest. So All right. um, he's he's got this, um, uh, his own reason for getting John McClane, this revenge thing. Um, and it's Alexander Godunov, who we, who was a ballet dancer and, and is this hulk of a man who really stands out in the film. Um, and I found out, I mean, I knew that he had been um, Jacqueline Bissett's partner for several years, uh, in the 80s, I think. Um, but the fact that uh, that Jacqueline Bissett was was in the detective opposite Frank Sinatra in the prequel movie is a nice symmetry. Wow. So it makes me feel uh, fonder of that character. <laughs> oh, that's a fascinating connection. Yeah. yeah. And what's the what's the prequel <laughs> movie named again? In case I try to find to see it. The detective. So it's not connected really to Die Hard, but the but the character the, the book the detective yeah. is the prequel to nothing lasts forever and yeah it was nice to see them to contrast them to compare and contrast that's cool well i'm a frank sinatra fan and uh catherine bissett fan so that that's that, that sounds good all right so what other movies remember we're in the lightning round here what other christmas movies are required viewing at your house <laughs> Well, all, all the terrible Netflix Christmas movies, but also <laughs> It's a Wonderful Life, definitely. And um, uh, A Christmas Carol, the both the Albert Finney and Alistair Sim versions. That's good. And what is the next Why We Love book for you? Uh, well, we haven't um, greenlit anything yet, but I'd really love to do Why We Love Halloween because that's I, horror is my first love. And that's another enduring franchise that just keeps going. All right. So let's talk about that because you, you can educate me here. Horror is your first love. I've never understood the draw of horror movies. You obviously do. Try to make me a believer. Um, well, I mean, 
It was the first, even before action, I think, was the first genre I was into. I never really watched Disney films as a kid. Um, horror was my Disney, that's what I always say. But it never, I, I don't know, it never, never particularly disturbed me as a kid for whatever reason. Maybe it's because I don't have a very active imagination, I don't know. Um, but what I love about horror, uh, two things in particular, that it can explore explore kind of the depths of the human psyche in a way that other movies can't in terms of what frightens us, but also how kind of um, depraved, I suppose, humanity can be, um, which I find really interesting to look into. Um, and also it, al it offered me women protagonists that didn't fit into the typical movie role for a woman um, growing up. So, you know, they were often the lead of the film. They won out at the end for all their problematic portrayals uh, that gets that get talked about. They at least had those things. And I found that I could identify with a lot of them. So, Huh. Yeah, that, that makes sense mm. uh, on, on the woman thing. And, uh, and you know, yeah, they, they, they get, they do get to be heroes because they're always, are very frequently cast as the very weak one. You're just waiting for them to get slayed. And then what well, do you know? They rise up and save yeah. the day. That's, that's a, that's a, that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, slasher, slasher films, um, you do are kind of problematic, you know, in the way that they, they, uh, they dispatch women characters, uh, in more detail and at length, they're terrorized more than any male deaths you might see on screen. Um, and, they're you know they're punished for for sexual activity um but there's always one woman who you might read as a male and i've written about that before but she is a woman who um gets to fight gets to win um and gets to do more than just be a love interest in a movie you know or set decoration or two-dimensional so yeah so that's that's one of the things that that drew me to horror Kim, is there anything you want to talk about that we haven't talked about? Um, I don't know. We talked. We've touched on westerns. We have touched on. Oh, I know. What did I learn while 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 researching the book that I didn't know before? Yeah. Really cool little fact. Um, so aside from the fact that the title of the movie Die Hard, which nobody liked, nobody liked Nothing Lasts Forever, which was the title of the book, because they felt it was too bleak. Uh, and But the author hated the title Die Hard because it, it's a battery, isn't it? It's a battery in the US, so a brand of batteries. Oh, right. Interesting. <laughs> but um, the title actually came from the director Shane Black, Um who had agreed to let Joel Silver, the producer, have the title that was his from the screenplay he was working on at the time that came to be known as The Last Boy Scout. Oh, <laughs> that yeah. was originally Die Hard. <laughs> well, that was also Bruce Willis in that, wasn't it? It wasn't him and Jamie Foxx? It was him and not Jamie Foxx. Uh, the name, his name's escaped me. It's not Jamie Foxx. Huh. Who the, Dirt, can you contribute to this? I am madly Googling you're, right come now. Come on, Dirt. Joe Rogan's guy would have found it by now, but you're not. <laughs> come on, jeez. Okay, hold. I'm yeah. almost there. Yeah, you're almost there? Uh, I'm almost there. I can see. Last Boy Scout. Damon, Damon Wayans. That's right. That's, it was about. It was on the Damon tip of my tongue. Damon Wayans. Damon Wayans. All right, that's right. Okay, yeah, that's right. Uh, I can't believe well, that went. <laughs> I know, that's very good. So, Kim, if someone wants to follow up with you or they want to uh, see what's going on with you, just uh, tell us how folks can stay in touch with you. Oh, well, I'd love it if you followed me on social media, on Instagram or Twitter. I am Kimbot, but it's K underscore Imbot. So that's complicated for you. <laughs> K underscore. K underscore I-M-B-O-T on both Instagram and Twitter. Or you can um, uh, find my articles and videos on fandom. Fantastic. 
Well, Kim, this has been very enlightening and very helpful. I know I'm more festive for the holiday spirit right now. I know I'm ready to go and get some eggnog and curl up against the fire and stare at my Christmas tree and and give gifts to people because Die Hard does that to me. Die Hard is absolutely a Christmas movie. I'm glad we've settled that today. And maybe the lightning, maybe the, I don't know, the meaning for all of us is you never know when you're going to find meaning. This is Christmas and you never know when you might have an encounter with something that is meaningful to you and maybe actually even an encounter with God. That's really what Christmas is about. It's the birth of Jesus, as, mu- as great as John McClain is. He's not Jesus. So we'll see you next time on The Aggressive Life. I just th- I thought, Dirt, like, I, I, mean, I can't, we're doing a Christmas thing, and I am a pastor <laughs> here, Jesus and I'm going to do a whole Christmas <laughs> thing and not say Jesus one time? I was like, that's really bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, I'm, probably. Up, I'm up for going under the radar, but that, that's, uh, have you lost your soul, man? You're, you're a freaking pastor, and your Christmas special is die hard, and the best you can say is God, like one time? Yeah. Well, you know, you kind of talked about it with the Matrix a little bit. Okay, Matrix. All right, yeah, whatever. A little bit. <laughs> we didn't even talk about the, his cut feet being representative of the stigmata. But Ooh, anyway. Talk about it. <laughs> oh, talk about there it. you go. Say talk it. about it, Kim. Save us. You've thought about this? <laughs> we, we did touch on um, John McClane's shoelessness and his cut feet and the fact that he can bleed. And, um, and uh, yes, there is this element of... of him representing a kind of a Jesus figure with the stigmata, his feet are bleeding. Um, and there are references to the, to the man upstairs and, and they don't mean God, but do they mean God? There are references like that. I think that, that, you know, it could be that they're talking about, um, or that he's talking about Gruber, but he could also be talking about God. So, so there is a, um, yeah, this kind of, theme running through it as well. Yet another reason to love Die Hard. Gosh, I am ready for Christmas <laughs> right now. yippee ki Merry Christmas. Yes. <laughs> we'll see you next year on The Aggressive Life. Hey, thanks for listening. For all things aggressive living, why don't you head over to bryantome.com find my new book, Move, a guide to get up and go forward, as well as articles and much, much more. And no matter where you listen to podcasts, why don't you take a second and leave us a rating, leave us a review. It really, really helps us drive new listeners to the show. We want to help as many people as possible, just like we may have helped you. We want to help others. So why don't you help us out? And if you want to connect, find me on Instagram at Brian Tome. Aggressive Life with Brian Tomes, a production of Crossroads Church, Cincinnati, Ohio.